So just to give you an example, this is a rat brain, so you notice there's not much cortex, and that's a good thing because you don't want rats running around with a lot of cortex. But you can see the CRF is in the places I talked about. It's localized in the hypothalamus and goes, goes down into the portal system and releases ACTH. It's localized in the amygdala, which is that CEA structure, and it's localized in the brainstem to do the things I'm telling you. The amygdala, um, there's plenty of CRF in the amygdala, and the amygdala gives you that fight or flight response. So when you're being chased by the bear, you run up and you run like hell, all right? And that's driven by the amygdala. So it's amazing when you think about it that this system, this one neuropeptide, it's 41 amino acids long, means it's 41 times the size of dopamine, so it is a big sucker in that sense. But this one peptide drives our whole body stress response. So um, that's interesting unto itself. Um, it's certainly probably part of the system that's involved in anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, and, and a variety of other possible disorders. But what I'm going to try and convince you of in a few minutes is that it's also a key part of the addiction process. So let's move to addiction. So this is on the cover of my book. I'm not too narcissistic, but there is a book out there called The Neurobiology of Addiction that I wrote with uh, Michel Lemoyle. And we chose this for the cover, and Elsevier was managed to get it for us. And I actually saw this uh, painting in Amsterdam. It was on loan from St. Petersburg, and it's a Picasso. And it's just a marvelous painting. But and there, at the turn of the 18th to the 19th century, there were more absence bars in Paris than there are Starbucks in Seattle, all right? So absence was a very favorite drink, and it's a very powerful drink. It has very high concentrations of alcohol, but it also has a, a concoction in it called oil of wormwood, which contains a, a convulsant drug, a stimulant drug called thujone. So when people were taking absence, they were taking an upper and a downer at the same time. And if you look at any of these paintings, and every Impressionist painter during this period painted a, a painting of an absence drinker or two, none of them have a smile on their face. Right? But I want to just make the point that there are multiple sources of reinforcement in addiction. We start off because it's fun. At some point, it was fun to begin with. But we end up uh, in the addiction cycle actually uh, working for the drug where it's not that much fun anymore. We're just relieving the problems that the drug created. And I'll go back over that point many times. But I, I like the idea that, that addiction is a composite of impulsivity and compulsivity. I teach a course on this in the winter time at, at the University of California, San Diego. And that, if you collapse impulsivity and compulsivity cycles, you end up with the three cycle uh, three stages of addiction cycle. And I think all of you can, can identify with a binge intoxication stage and a withdrawal negative affect stage. The preoccupation anticipation stage, if you want to put that in plain English, would be craving, all right? But preoccupation anticipation comes from social psychology. Now, in the process of, of, of describing that slide, I'm going to give you some terms that we're going to use through the rest of the talk. So, how do I define addiction? People ask me this all the time. I was at a scientific advisory board meeting for a center on mass spectroscopy and neurochemistry, and they wanted to know how I defined addiction and what is addiction. Well, chronic, chronically relapsing disorder is characterized by a compulsion to seek and take drugs or a stimulus, loss of control in limiting intake, and I think everybody would agree with that part, okay? That's kind of standard operating procedure. You can find it everywhere. But the next bit is, is my bit. And that's going to be my bias in this talk. And that's the emergence of a negative emotional state, um, dysphoria, anxiety, irritability, when access to the drug or stimulus is prevented. And I've written about this, and I call it the dark side of addiction. Let's have some other simple terms. Positive reinforcement, you all know what that is. That's where a stimulus or a drug increases the probability of a response. Um, think SeaWorld. Think dolphin jumping through a hoop. Think trainer slipping the dolphin a fish after it successfully jumps through the hoop. All right? Reward is the same thing. You have drug withdrawal. It's aversive. You take the drug to eliminate that aversive state. And then a couple of other things. Nucleus accumbens, I'm going to tell you about this. This is, is kind of like key confluence of 
of circuitry that's involved in motivation and reward. Uh, dopamine we call an incentive salience neurotransmitter. And then opioid peptides I call the brain comfort neurotransmitters. Opioid peptides are normally released in states of stress when you have, particularly in painful states. They're also uh, released in separation situations, mother-infant, and you know some people argue they're even released in, in pair bonding. Did you know there are these voles? You know what a vole is? It's a little rodent that has a short tail. But there are, there are prairie voles, and they're monogamous. They, they stay together for life. And then there are mountain voles. I call those the Bill Clinton voles. And they're promiscuous. You know, they're out poking every other vole they can find. So, but the prairie voles have a lot of these endorphins, these opioid peptides, um, that, keep, that seem to keep them monogamous. And they really go into a depression when, when one of the, the pairs is lost to a predator. But anyway, here's our addiction cycle back together. For those of you who, who are studied in psychiatry and clinical psychology, I mean, these are the dsm 4 criteria superimposed upon us. So this slide is, is what I call my life's work, okay? This is our brain on, the, on this side, on our left-hand side here. And, and the blue is the parts that are involved in making us feel good and the binge intoxication stage. And the red is involved in the negative affect or withdrawal stage. And the green, which you, you can see, even without being an aficionado of neuroanatomy, are more cortical structures, are the ones that are involved in craving, as you might expect. And then the rest of it is all kind of circuit diagrams of what talks to what. So, what I'm going to first do is break this down and very quickly give you some examples of what we know about the chemistry and, and neuroanatomy of the binge intoxication stage. So for 20 or 30 years now, your tax dollars have paid the National Institute on Drug Abuse to answer the question, what makes you high? Now, I'm not sure that answering the question, what makes us high when we take a drug, is really going to solve the problem of addiction. Well, we need to know what makes us high and what chemicals are released and where before we can find out how the brain changes as the addiction process evolves. So we learned early on that there's in the reptile brain, as I call it, this is again a representative rodent brain, there is a, a prominent structure called the medial forebrain bundle. It's a two-way highway that goes back and forth from the forebrain and the brainstem. And if you put an electrode there and you let and you stimulate it with tiny, tiny amounts of current. In other words, you do what we call nowadays in the human condition deep brain stimulation. Rats love it. They go nuts over it. Simon asked me how I got into this field. I was watching rats self-stimulate their brains. In fact, here's one of my rats. This is actually from my PhD thesis. I took this rat, I anesthetized it, I wrapped it in a towel, I walked across the street at Hopkins to the radiology department and I said, hey guys, can you x-ray my rat? They said, oh, sure, Coob, and they ran it right through the x-ray machine. If we did that today, I'd be fired and they'd be fired, you know? <coughs> but you can see, if you go back and forth, that that electrode is right there in the posterior part of the uh, hypothalamus toward the ventral tegmental area. There's something else that occurs. We have, we, I mean, and then just to remind you, we have a medial forebrain bundle in the human, and it, it goes right through the hypothalamus, that same structure that drives our stress system, by the way, and, and it starts right in the midbrain. It's a little more vestigial in us, so maybe we don't have as much fun as rats. I don't know. Maybe we think too much and we have less fun than rats because we have all this huge amount of cortex, and, but we still have what I call the reptile brain. And here's where it gets interesting. It didn't take long for researchers to figure out that this medial forebrain bundle had a heavy component that was dopamine. So the cell bodies, remember I told you, neurons have cell bodies and they have projections. The cell bodies for the dopamine system start in the ventral tegmental area. And right there where they start, right, at the, right toward the, this side of where they start, is the hottest area for brain stimulation reward. One of the ways we did this is we use a technique called in vivo microdialysis, which involves lowering into the brain of a rodent a, a tube with two tubes inside it that are about the size of a human hair that you push cerebral spinal fluid flu through. And there's a semi-permeable membrane at the tip down here. And that 
cerebral spinal fluid is passing through tissue in the brain and picking up the transmitters that are there and measuring their level. It's called in vivo microdialysis.